this famous ship in port and they're giving credit to the story to Plutarch. He's more of a historian than a philosopher, but um, we're still going to discuss it here because I think it's really important having to do, and we can, I can show you a Socratic dialogue even if I can't pull up an easy one for you to look at. So the question being posed is, this famous ship that over decades as it decays, they replace the wood out, and you eventually get to a day where there is no original wood left of that ship. It's been completely replaced. And so the question is, is that still the ship of Theseus? Or if it's not, where along the way did it stop becoming the ship of Theseus and something else? And who would like to tackle that that question. It's funny because I'm much more given to existential philosophy or idealism, but this, you can see the materialistic presuppositions because everything about this scenario has to do with the physical material nature of the ship. But we already know from quantum mechanics and quantum physics that that ship is changing constantly, right? If we're just talking about the physicality of the ship, then I would just adamantly say, no. As soon as you launched the ship of Theseus, it was no longer the ship of Theseus, because it's changed from when they christened it to the time it slid into the water, it's not the freaking same ship. And I don't care if you haven't changed out any boards or not, it's a different ship. But is that really what makes a ship a ship? Or a name a name? Is it an idea? Is it a concept? Is it a value? Is it a style? What is it that persists? And what is it that fades away? And so I think it's a great example to talk about the difference between idealists who could say, if the ship is an idea or a concept, how many iterations of the Starship Enterprise did we have? And they were all the enterprise, even though they went through all these different models and gradations and millennia, it's still the same ship because it's still the same idea, the same concept, the same mission, even though the technology and materials have changed countless times. But if you're simply talking about something being made up of its material parts, then it seems like once you lose one board, it may still be the ship of Theseus, but it's now only 99% of the ship of Theseus. And my thought process is the exact opposite. It, oh, is, good. Let's it hear. is always the ship of Theseus, no matter what the change is. And I'll put that into perspective of Wayne. So... Wayne has changes in his life day in and day out. Right. Once, once there was that initial change, that doesn't mean that Wayne is now something else. No, I'm, I'm still Wayne, but I've had so many different changes in my life, but I'm still Wayne. Correct. Now, does it matter that you're a living being? No. See, an animist could say the same thing with the ship. If there was like a spirit of Theseus or a spirit of the ship of Theseus, then who cares if it gets different planks as long as that core essential spirit of Theseus remains. Same with Wayne. I mean, you're obviously not the same as you were when you were 10 or when you were born, but your physical body at least, but there's still a Wayne in there that has continued even though virtually, well, all your parts have changed. I mean, we average every seven years, our body completely regenerates itself. Some parts faster than others, but it works out to about every seven years, you have a new body. So you're working on probably your, I don't know, sixth, seventh vehicle by now. And mine, I think I'm on my eighth. Sixth and seventh vehicle? <laughs> yeah, but I'm still Fred. But 
this is a very different vehicle I had than my last one, let alone the one I had when I was yeah. 14, which was my second vehicle, or starting on my third. See, now and you're so, making me do math. Right. Um, but like, if you're more of an idealist or like an existentialist, we may not be concerned about the physical material ship. We may be more interested in either experience or identity or personal ideation. And so a, a simple question like that, depending on how someone answers it, could tell you a lot about their philosophic presuppositions, whether they're an idealist or a materialist. And so I think it's super valuable for that reason, if, if no other. And man, I love philosophy. I mean, who thinks about stuff like that? What a great question to ask. It's the same thing, like our school. Um, we have a different name. We have a different location. We have different um, people in administration and on the board. Is it still San Diego Christian College or is it still Christian Heritage College? When we changed the name, a lot of our alumni said, well, I don't have a college anymore. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's still your college. We just changed the name. They're like, nope, my college is gone. The school I went to is no. And I was just like, wow, that's so interesting. If right? that's the case, then uh, their degrees are no longer valid. <laughs> and they're not college educated. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll tell them that next time. I think your degree holds, though, even if you're school goes under at least if it went under still accredited <laughs> any other comments or questions i tend to like think of both kind of like that postmodern uh oh both and what oh the yeah, yeah. the both and <laughs> yeah so like what's it called like the essence of what it is like the meaning of what it is like what it was is kind of like kind of like the the spiritual kind of like unseen type thing but physically like it's not the same as it was before so like i think that it could mean the same thing like in essence like it could be the same ship in essence but like like physically like it's not the same right i love it great app cross class application autumn i i love that so we were talking about postmodernism today and anthropology and so the postmodern solution like autumn just rolled out is both are the ship of Theseus, yeah. one in kind of spirit or essence and the other in physical form. But you don't have to pick either or, this one is, this one isn't, but it's like, no, they both are just in different ways. It's just a different way of looking at it. And that's a much more inclusive way than thinking rather than this either or dialectic, like black and white, right or wrong, high or low, mm -hmm. good or evil. This is just like, well, it, it kind of is and it kind of isn't all at the same time. And that's very hard from someone that wants an either or answer. But often either or answers when you're dealing especially with metaphysical questions or questions about God or these biggie ones, an either or answer isn't going to cut it. Mm -hmm. It's it's too complex to deal with in that because you're you're going to leave out too much that is true by letting the other side go because there is some truth in what the other side is saying. And so if you want the whole truth, you have to find some way to incorporate the thesis, the antithesis and the synthesis, but we're a ways from getting to that in philosophy. We're, we're another 1200 years off from that solution, at least in the West. My biggest question is why did she use the uh, 543? as like the uh, turning point from uh, the, the two different ships, wouldn't it be like 501 exactly right past the halfway point that it's no longer? Yeah, I don't know. I think she just picked some random number. Okay. Be, she probably was a, avoiding 501 for exactly that reason, <laughs> because then that would even more um, buy into that materialistic answer. Okay. Once you get the majority of the original on one side of the equation, then that becomes the true ship of Theseus. And the other one is no longer it. But that's a huge problem. I like Autumn's um, postmodern both and answer better. 
or my existential um, either it's always the ship of Theseus because it's a concept or an idea or as soon as you launch it, as soon as you hit that last nail in, it's no longer the same ship because everything's changing. Because now it's complete. But both of those are really extreme yeah. ways of looking at it. Okay. Um, man, I want to see, let me just see, bear with me a little. I'm sorry I'm not more prepared. I just, like I said, yesterday was so intense. And then today I've been going nonstop since eight as well. So I just want to see if I can get, instead of his point counterpoint, I remember this, um, He does a monologue on love. So normally he's having conversations with other and collectively they're trying to arrive at a, a conclusion or an understanding or an answer. But in this one, um, he's going to talk about love. And I'll read this as much as until I see your guys' eyes roll back into your head. So just sit back, try to take this in. Um, and now, said Socrates, I will ask about love. Is love of something or of nothing? Of something, surely, Agathon replied. Keep in mind what this is and tell me what I want to know, whether love desires that of which love is. Yes, surely. And does he possess or does he not possess that which he loves and desires? Probably not, I should say. Nay, replied Socrates, I would have you consider whether necessarily is not rather the word, the inference that he who desires something is in want of something, and that he who desires nothing is in want of nothing. It is in my judgment, Agathon, absolutely and necessarily true. What do you think? So the first movement Socrates is making is we desire or want that which we do not have because if we already had it we wouldn't desire it does that make sense now this is a huge presupposition socrates is very subtly just sneaking in at the front end of the argument but if you buy into this he is going to take you on a wild ride and you may not like where you're going to end up so he's saying we only desire that which we do not have because if we had it we there'd be no desire for it. it would, there would simply be a contentment and we already possessed it. I agree with you, said Agathon. Very good. Would he who is great desire to be great or he who is strong desire to be strong? No, nonsense, because they already are those things. You, we desire what we lack. That would be inconsistent with our previous admissions. True, for he who is anything cannot want to be that which he is. Very true, and yet added, Socrates, if a man being strong desired to be strong, or being swift desired to be swift, or being healthy desired to be healthy, in that case he might be thought to desire something which he already has or is. I give the example in order that we may avoid misconception. For the possessors of these qualities, Agathon, must be supposed to have their respective advantages at the time, whether they choose or not, and who can desire that which he has. Therefore, when a person says, I am well, and wish to be well, or I am rich and wish to be rich, and I desire simply to have what I have, to him we shall reply, you, my friend, having wealth, health, and strength, want to have the continuance of them. For at this moment, whether you choose or not, you already have them. So that's the, a good distinction Socrates is making. Um, someone who is intelligent doesn't desire to be intelligent. They are intelligent. Now they may desire to continue being intelligent, but now their desires in the continuation, not in the intelligence. Does that make sense? Okay. A subtle little movement on Socrates' part. He must, replied Agathon. Then said Socrates, he desires that which he has at present may be preserved to him in the future, which is equivalent to saying that he desires something which is non-existent to him 
and which as yet he has not got. So for example, I could desire to be intelligent tomorrow, but if I'm already intelligent today, it's nonsensical to desire what I already have. Very true, he said. Then now, said Socrates, let us recapitulate the argument. First, is not love of something and of something too, which is wanting to a man? In other words, isn't being loved or loving another something men desire? Yes, he replied, remember further what you said in your speech, or if you do not remember, I will remind you. You said that the love of the beautiful set in order the empire of the gods. For that of deformed things, there is no love. Did you not say something of that kind? So the gods love the beautiful, not that which is broken, flawed, deformed, tainted. Yes, said Agathon. Yes, my friend, and their mark was a just one. And if this is true, love is the love of beauty and not of deformity. He assented, and the admission has been already made that love is of something which a man wants and has not. True, he said, then love wants and has not beauty? Certainly, he replied, and would you call the beautiful which wants and does not possess beauty? Certainly not. Then would you still say that love is beautiful? Agathon replied, I fear that I did not understand what you are saying. So let's, let's review this movement. The admission you've already made, the guy he's talking to, Agathon, is that love is of something which a man wants but does not have. Okay, so we crave that love or that affection if it's missing in our lives. If we already have it, then we don't desire it. True, he said. Then he said, then love wants beauty because it doesn't have it? And he said, certainly. And would you call that beautiful, which wants and does not possess beauty? So some, someone that wants beauty, would you say that they're already beautiful? And Agathon saying, of course not. They want beauty because they're not already beautiful. You see the problem that's happening here, though. Already Socrates is leading him down the path to get him to admit that those who want love want it because they do not have it. You made a very good speech, Agathon, replied Socrates, but there is yet one small question which I would ask. Is not the good also beautiful? Okay. Yes, then in wanting the beautiful, aren't you also wanting the good? Which means if you want it, you don't have it. Okay. I can't refute you, Socrates, said Agathon. Let's assume that what you say is true. Say rather, beloved Agathon, that you cannot refute the truth, for Socrates is easily refuted. <laughs> he is such a character and very full of himself, but he has very subtly in this first five stanzas worked in the true, the good, the beautiful as being synonyms. And he's using love as his vehicle to make this argument, but he's going to do this really shocking pivot now when he begins to speak of the Greek gods. And this is part of what got him in trouble and got him executed, is because he carried this line of thinking into the Greek pantheon. And this is a polytheistic culture and a lot of people were incredibly offended by Socrates' questions. Okay, and now taking my leave of you, I would rehearse a tale of love, which I heard from Diotima of Man. And so here's his monologue. So normally he's doing this question and response discussion, but now he wants to tell a story of something that really struck him that he heard. And so just bear with me as I read this monologue and no dialogue. A, a, a tale of love, which I heard from Diotima, a woman wise in this and in many other kinds of knowledge who in the days of old, when the Athenians offered sacrifice before the coming of the plague, delayed the disease for 10 years. And remember I told you about in Acts chapter 17, 
where Paul is on Mars Hill and there's an altar to the unknown God, some people think it dates back to this plague period in Athens where they were praying to every deity they could think of and they made this altar just in case someone got left out. They didn't want to offend anybody. And it was just kind of their just in case altar for the unknown God or that God that is beyond our human comprehension. I love it. Absolutely love it. Okay, so she was my instructress in the art of love. And I shall repeat to you what she said to me, beginning with the admissions made by Agathon, which are nearly, if not quite the same, which I made to the wise woman when she questioned me. I think that this will be the easiest way, and I shall take both parts as well as I can. As you, Agathon, suggested, I must speak first of the being and nature of love, and then of his works. First I said to her, in nearly the same words which you used to me, that love was a mighty God, and likewise fair, and she proved to me, as I proved to him, that by my own showing, love was neither fair nor good. What do you mean, Diatima? I said. Is love then evil and foul? Hush, she cried. Must thou be foul? Must that be foul which is not fair? Certainly, I said. And is that which is not wise ignorant? Do you not see that there is a mean between wisdom and ignorance? And what may that be, I said? Right opinion, she replied, which as you know, being incapable of giving a reason is not knowledge, for how can knowledge be devoid of reason? Nor again ignorance, for neither can ignorance attain the truth, but is clearly something which is a mean between ignorance and wisdom. Quite true, I replied. Do not then insist, she said, that what is not fair is necessarily foul, or what is not good is necessarily evil, or infer that because love is not fair and good, he is therefore foul and evil, for he is the mean between them. Ooh, this is very interesting now. Well, I said, love is surely admitted by all to be a great God, by those who know or by those who do not know. By all? And how, Socrates, she said with a smile, can love be acknowledged to be a great God by those who say that he is not a God at all? And who are they, I said. You and I are two of them, she replied. How can that be, I said. It's quite intelligible, she replied, for you yourself would acknowledge that the gods are happy and fair, and of course you would, you would to say that any God is not. Certainly not, I replied. And you mean by happy those who are possessors of things good and fair, yes? And you admitted that love, because he was in want, desires those good and fair things of which he is in want. Yes, I did. But how can he be a God who has no portion in what is either good or fair? Impossible. Then you see that you also deny the divinity of love. Okay. And... Let me go ahead and move into his second movement and see if it clears up the questions you may have from the first one. And so Socrates is doing both parts, his questions and his teacher's answers. What then is love, I ask? Is he mortal? No. What then? As in the former instance, he is neither mortal nor immortal, but a mean between the two. What is he, Diatima? He is a great spirit, a diamond, and like all spirits, he is intermediate between the divine and the mortal. And what I say is his power. He interprets, she replied, between gods and men, conveying and taking across to the gods the prayers and sacrifices of men, and to men the commands and replies of the gods. He is the mediator who spans the chasm which divides them, and therefore in him all is bound together, and through him the arts of the prophet and the priest their sacrifices and mysteries and charms, and all prophecy and incantation find their way. For God mingles not with man, but through love. All the intercourse and converse of God with man, whether awake or asleep, is carried on. The wisdom which understands this is spiritual. All other wisdom, such as the arts and handicrafts, is mean and vulgar. Now these spirits, or intermediate powers, are many and diverse, and one of them is love. And who, I said, was his father, and who his mother? The tale, she said, will take time. Nevertheless, I will tell you. 
On the birthday of Aphrodite, there was a feast of the gods, at which the god Poros of Plenty, who is the son of Medus, or discretion, was one of the guests. When the feast was over, Penia, or poverty, as the manner is on such occasions, came about the doors to beg. Now Plenty, who was the worse for nectar, there was no wine in those days, went into the garden of Zeus and fell into a heavy sleep. And Poverty, considering her own state and circumstances, plotted to have a child by him. And accordingly, she lay down at his side and conceived love, who partly, because he is naturally a lover of the beautiful, and because Aphrodite is herself beautiful, and also because he was born on her birthday, is her follower and attendant. And as his parentage is also are his fortunes. In the first place, he is always poor. <laughs> love, love is always poor. I love it. And anything but tender and fair, as the many imagine him. And he is rough and squalid and has no shoes nor a house to dwell in. On the bare earth exposed, he lies under the open heaven in the streets or in the doors of houses, taking his rest, and like his mother, he is always in distress. Like his father, too, whom he also partly resembles, he is always plotting against the fair and good. He is bold, enterprising, strong, a mighty hunter, always weaving some intrigue or other, keen in the pursuit of wisdom, fertile in resources, a philosopher at all times, terrible as an enchanter, sorcerer, and sophist. He is by nature neither mortal nor immortal, but alive and flourishing at one moment when he is in plenty and dead at another moment and again alive by reason of his father's nature. But that which is always flowing in is always flowing out. And so he is never in want and never in wealth. And further, he is in the mean between ignorance and knowledge. The truth of the matter is this, no God is a philosopher or seeker after wisdom for he is wise already. It's the same way I like to mess with my students and tell people um, God has no faith. But what would God possibly have faith in? God doesn't need faith because he has complete knowledge. We have faith in that which we don't know. Okay, so it's the same sort of thing idea here with love. Um, love is being portrayed as its parents being the god of plenty and the goddess of poverty. And love is somewhere stuck in between these two places. And so sometimes love is like a hunter, it's overflowing, it's generous, it's flowing, it's giving. And then at other times it's stingy, it's clingy, it's jealous, it's, it's clinging to try not to lose what it has and it's always in want. And what a great, personification of love right when you think about love in your own life and all the different moods it has filled you with at sometimes you just feel intoxicated by love and sated and filled and other times you're just like a starving craving you feel so empty and desperate for it and usually we're like moving somewhere in between those two expressions of love and the two parents or the lineage of love Okay. So at that point, does love marry hate? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Who then? Socrates is come frustrated out of his mind now, basically because he's getting messed with like other, like he messes with other people. Diatoma is using the, his same technique on him, but maybe that's where he learned it from. He says, who then loves? Who are the lovers of wisdom if they are neither the wise or the foolish? Because the wise don't love wisdom because they already have it. And the fool doesn't love wisdom because they love their ignorance and they don't want it. Who then loves wisdom? Ah, child. Oh, no. She says, a, ch a child may answer that question, she replied, Socrates. They are those who are in the mean between the two. Love is one of them. For wisdom is a beautiful thing, and love is of the beautiful. And therefore, love is also a philosopher or lover of wisdom, 
right? Philo, Sophia, love of wisdom. And being a lover of wisdom is a mean between the wise and the ignorant. And of this too, his birth is the cause. For his father is wealthy and wise, and his mother poor and foolish. Such, my dear Socrates, is the nature of the spirit of love. The error in your conception of him was very natural. And as I imagine from what you say has arisen out of confusion of love and the beloved, which made you think that love was all beautiful. For the beloved is the truly beautiful and delicate and perfect and blessed. But the principle of love is of another nature and is such as I have described. I said, O oh, thou stranger woman, thou sayest well, but assuming love to be such as you say, what is the use of love to men? That, Socrates, she replied, I will attempt to unfold. Of his nature and birth I have already spoken. And you acknowledge that love is of the beautiful. But some will say, of the beautiful in what, Socrates, in Diotima? Or rather, let me put the question more dearly and ask, what a man, when a man loves the beautiful, what does he desire? And I answered her, that the beautiful may be his. Right? So when we say we love something beautiful, we're loving it because we want to make it our own. Still, she said, the answer suggests a further question. What is given by the possessor of beauty? To what you have asked, I replied, I have no answer ready. Then she said, let me put the word good in the place of the beautiful and repeat the question once more. If he who loves good, what is it then that he loves? He wants to be in possession of the good. And what does he gain when he possesses the good, Diatoma asked. Happiness, I replied. There is less difficulty in answering that question. Yes, she said. The happier made happy by the acquisition of good things. Nor is there any need to ask why a man desires happiness. The answer is already final. Happiness is an end unto itself. Um, yes, the happier made happy by the acquisition. Okay, you're right, I said. And is this wish and this desire common to all? And do all men always desire their own good or only some men? What do you say? All men, I replied, the desire is common to all. Why then, she rejoined, are not all men, um, Socrates said to love, but only some of them. Whereas you said that all men are always loving the same things. I myself wonder, I said, why is this? There is nothing to wonder at, she replied. The reason is that one part of love is separated off and receives the name of the whole, but the other parts have other names. Give an illustration, I said. She answered me as follows. There is poetry, which as you know is complex and manifold. All creation or passage of non-being into being is poetry or making. And the process of all art are creative. And the masters of arts are all poets or makers. Very true. Still, she said, you know that they are not called poets, but have other names. Only that portion of the art which is separated off from the rest and is concerned with music and meter is termed poetry. And they who possess poetry in this sense of the word are called poets. Very true, I said. And the same holds of love. For you may say generally that all desire of good and happiness is only the great and subtle power of love, but they who are drawn towards him by any other path whether the path of money-making or gymnastics or philosophy are not called lovers. The name of the whole is appropriated to those whose affection takes only one form. Only they are said to love or to be lovers. I dare say, I replied, that you are right. Yes, she added, and you hear people say that lovers are seeking their other half, but I say that they are seeking neither for the half of themselves nor for the whole, unless the half or the whole be also a good. And they will cut off their own hands and feet and cast them away if they are evil, for they love not what is their own, unless perchance there be someone who calls what belongs to him the good, and what belongs to another the evil. For there is nothing which men love but the good. <clears throat> is there anything? Certainly, Socrates said, I would say there is nothing. Then she said, the simple truth is, 
that men love the good. Yes, I said, to which must be added that they love the possession of the good. Yes, that must be added. And not only the possession, but the everlasting possession of the good. That must be added too. Then love, she said, must be described generally as the love of the everlasting possession of the good. That is the most true. Okay, so if you're all following so far, she's trying to get him to understand that love in and of itself isn't good or evil, high or low, kind or cruel, but it lives in this kind of in-between part. But because of our culture and society, we like to latch on to certain positive elements of love and highlight those, but we forget about the rough and tumble, poverty and foolish part of love. So we have the noble, wealthy, generous, wise part of love and the poor and foolish part of love. And that's how this conversation is going. Love somewhere in between, but we're like fixated only on one aspect of it. But the end goal, all humans are seeking the good because the good provides happiness. And later when you take ethics with me, um, when we cover Aristotle's ethics, that's what he believes the end result or end goal of man is, is happiness. The good life should produce happiness. <clears throat> and I don't mean yuppie happiness, circumstantial happiness. I mean that deep abiding contentment, joy, sense of well-being, a well-balanced proportion life. That's what he means by happiness. Not like, oh, I'm so happy my football team won, or I'm so happy I've got a good girlfriend or boyfriend, or I'm so happy um, Blackburn's, I'm doing a short class today. Whatever. He's not talking about that. He's talking about that deep abiding, that regardless of fires, plague, drought, death, poverty, you can still have this place of contentment and well-being because your happiness isn't dependent on these other things because you now have the good inside of you. You are good. You're not seeking it anymore. It's become a part of you. Okay, enough of Fred in there. Let me bear with me a little bit more. <clears throat> then if this be the true nature of love, can you tell me further, she said, what is the manner of the pursuit? What are they doing who show all this eagerness and heat, which is called love? And what is the object which they have in view? Answer me. Nay, Diatima, I replied, if I had known, I should not have wondered at your wisdom. Neither should I have come to learn from you about this matter. Well, she said, I will teach you. The object which they have in view is birth and beauty, whether of body or soul. I don't understand you, said Socrates. The oracle requires an explanation. I will make my meaning clear. That's funny, she's mocking Socrates as the oral need, oracle needs an explanation. I will make my meaning de dearer, she replied. I mean to say that all men are bringing to the birth in their bodies and in their souls. There is a certain age at which human nature is desirous of procreation. Procreation which must be in beauty and not in deformity. And this procreation is the union of man and woman and is a divine thing for conception and generation are an immortal principle in the mortal creature and in the inharmonious they can never be. But the deformed is always inharmonious with the divine and the beautiful harmonious. Beauty then is the destiny or goddess of parturition, which presides at birth. Well, I, that's a new word for me. Will someone look this up? I'm going to spell it. Ready? Um, P-A-R-T-U-R-I-T-I-O-N. Parturitation. Destiny. Um, beauty then is the destiny or goddess of Parturitation, which presides at birth, and therefore, when approaching beauty, the conceiving power is propitious and diffusive and benign, and begets and bears fruit. At the sight of ugliness, she frowns and contracts and has a sense of pain, and turns away and shrivels up, and not without a pain, refrains from conception. And this is the reason why, when the hour of conception arrives, and the teeming nature is full, 
there is such a flutter and ecstasy about beauty whose approach is the alleviation of the pain of travail. For love, Socrates, is not as you imagine the love of the beautiful only. What then? The love of generation and of birth and beauty. Yes, I said. Yes, indeed, she replied. But why of generation? Because to the mortal creature, generation is a sort of eternity and immortality, she replied. And if, as has been already admitted, love is of the everlasting possession of the good, all men will necessarily desire immortality together with good. Wherefore, love is of immortality. Did someone get that word? I did. I looked it up. Uh, so, uh, partuitation is uh, calfing or birthing. Okay. Which, which is actually broken down into multiple stages. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so there's actually three stages. So the first stage is dilation. Uh, the second stage is uh, the delivery. And then the third stage is uh, the shedding of the placenta or fetal membranes. Wow. Well, let's get, let's try to work that into a sentence this week, right? <laughs> Let me hear you pronounce it again, Wayne. I think you did a better job than I did. Partuitution? Part. Partuitution. Part. Chew. There is. Wait, I'm trying. Here, let me. There's an R in there, right? Yeah. Partuitution. Yeah, it's uh, P A R C H. Let me let me pull up the actual. Mine like, is T U P A R T U R I T I O N. There's no H in yeah. it. Yeah. Parturition. 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 And that means stages of birth. Yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, hang with me. They're trying to bring it home. <clears throat> All of this she taught me at various times when she spoke of love. And I remember her once saying to me, what is the cause, Socrates, of love and the attendant desire? See you not how all animals, birds, as well as beasts in their desire of procreation are in agony. And when they take the infection of love, which begins with the desire of union, whereto is added the care of offspring on whose behalf the weakest are ready to battle against the strongest, even to the uttermost and to die for them, and will let themselves be tormented with hunger or suffer anything in order to maintain their young. And it's true, I mean, look at the animal kingdom. When the rut is on, it is crazy in the wilderness, you know, from the rams bashing their horns together to the bugling of the elk um, to animals th this craving desire for procreation and then they will literally lay down their lives for their offspring and many species man may be supposed to act thus from reason but why should animals have these passionate feelings can you tell me why again i replied i don't know and she said to me and do you expect ever to become a master in the art of love if you don't know this? But I have told you already, Diatima, that my ignorance is the reason why I came to you, for I am conscious that I, I need a teacher. Tell me then the cause of this and other mysteries of love. Marvel not, she said, if you believe that love is of the immortal, as we have seen several times acknowledged, for here again, and on the sample principle too, the mortal nature is seeking as far as possible to be everlasting and immortal. Seeking what it does not have, right? Because if it was everlasting and immortal, it wouldn't be seeking it. But because we're not everlasting and immortal, that's something we desire. Love it. And this is only to be attained by generation, because generation always leaves behind a new existence in the place of the old. Now, in this sense, the immortality comes through having progeny or offspring. It's not like your individual self keeps to living on, but you live on through your descendants. It sounds like the type of immortality they're talking about here. <clears throat> Nay, even if in the life of the same individual there is a succession and not absolute unity, a man is called the same, and yet in the short interval which elapses between youth and age, and in which every animal is said to have life and identity, he is undergoing a perpetual process and loss. A, a reparation of hair, flesh, bones, blood, and the whole body are always changing, 
which is true not only of the body, but also of the soul, the essence, right? It's not just the boards of Theseus, the, the ship of Theseus that are changing, but the very essence of the ship is also changing over time. And I'd say the same would be for Wayne and myself, even though we're, we've gone through multiple physical vehicles that we've been traveling through our life on earth in, um, and I guess that's the debatable question. Are we still the same essence we were when we were conceived? Or has even that, that soul, that immaterial part of us changed through time? And I could see arguing both ways on that, but let me keep moving. Which is true not only of the body, but also of the soul, whose habits, tempers, opinions, desires, pleasures, pains, fears never remain the same in any one of us. Well, that's for sure. I mean, I'm about 180 degrees than where I was when I was 18, 19 years old. My thinking is like almost completely inverted. It's You wouldn't even recognize me if you heard me talk as a young man. Um, anyways, onward. Not only do the sciences in general spring up and decay, so that in respect of them, we are never the same, but each of them individually experiences a like change for what is implied in the word recollection, but the departure of knowledge, which is ever being forgotten and is renewed and preserved for recollection and appears to be the same, although in reality, new, according to the law of succession, by which all mortal things are preserved, not absolutely the same, but by substitution, the old worn out mortality, leaving another and new similar existence behind, unlike the divine, which is always the same and not another. And in this way, Socrates, the mortal body or mortal anything partakes of immortality, but the immortal in another way, marvel not then at the love which all men have of their offspring for the universal love and interest is for the sake of immortality. I was astonished at her words and I said, is this really love or is this really true? Why is Diotima? And she answered with all the authority of an accomplished sophist, of that Socrates, you may be assured, think only of the ambition of men and you will wonder at the senselessness of their ways, unless you consider how they are stirred by the love of an immortality of fame. Okay, I'm going to skip down. Those who are pregnant in the body only betake themselves to women and beget children thus, and this is the character of their love. Their offspring, as they hope, will preserve their memory and give them the blessedness and immortality which they desire in the future. Like your children remembering you and telling your grandchildren about you and them telling your great-grandchildren about you. That's the type of immorality people who are pregnant in body or love in body pursue. <clears throat> But souls which are pregnant for their certainty are men who are more creative in their souls than in their bodies. And they conceive that which is proper for the soul is to conceive or contain. And what are these conceptions? Wisdom and virtue in general. And such creators are poets and all artists who are deserving of the name inventor. But the greatest and fairest sort of wisdom by far is that which is concerned with the ordering of states and families and which is called temperance and justice. And he who in youth has the seed of these implanted in him and is himself inspired when he comes to maturity desires to beget and generate. He wanders about seeking beauty that he may beget offspring for in deformity he will beget nothing and naturally embraces the beautiful rather than the deformed body. Above all, when he finds fair and noble and well-nurtured soul, he embraces the two in one person, and to such a one he is full of speech about virtue and the nature pursuits of a good man, and he tries to educate him. And at the touch of the beautiful, which is ever present in his memory, even when absent, he be, brings forth that which he conceived long before, and in company with him tends that which he brings forth and they are married by a far nearer tie and have a closer friendship than those who beget mortal children. For the children who are their common offspring are fairer and more immortal. Who, when he thinks of Homer and Hesiod and other great poets, would not rather have their children than ordinary ones? Who would not, Im and who are the children of Homer and Hesiod? It's their books, it's their ideas. 
it's their concepts. I just published my first book and it literally was like having a baby. It was like I was conceiving and producing and bringing into life. And part of why I did it, the same reason for immortality, that my ideas and concepts will live on after this frame is gone. Where other people, Plato or Socrates in this case would say more base people, the more common people, they're satisfied by birth and physical babies, but the artist, the poet, the philosopher, the theologian, they want to birth ideas, concepts, the beautiful, the good, the true, not just more humans, <laughs> okay? These are the lesser mysteries of love into which even you, Socrates, may enter, to the greater and more hidden ones, which are the crown of these, and to which if you pursue them in a right spirit, they will lead. I know not whether you will be able to attain them, but I will do my utmost to inform you. And do you follow of them and follow them if you can. For he who would proceed aright in this manner should begin in youth to visit beautiful forms, and first, if he be guided by his instructor aright to love one such form, only out of that he should create fair thoughts. And soon he will of himself perceive that the beauty of one form is akin to the beauty, excuse me, in another. And I love this idea of education. And you've probably heard this in, in other ways. If we bring up children showing them what is the good, the true, and the beautiful, and that resonates with them, and it begins to conceive ideas in their own minds, they will be able to see the good, the true, and the beautiful wherever it manifests themselves. And I don't know, this is like some deep, deep waters now that we're getting into. He who has been instructed thus far in the things of love and who has learned to see the beautiful in due order and succession, when he comes towards the end, will suddenly perceive a nature of wondrous beauty. And this, Socrates, is the final cause of all our former toils, a nature which in the first place is everlasting, not growing, not decaying, not waxing or waning. Secondly, not fair in one point and foul in another, or at one time in one relation, in a place fair and another time in another place foul, or as fair to some and fouls to other, or in the likeness of a face or hands or any other part of bodily frames, or in any form of speech or knowledge or existing in any other thing, as for example, in an animal or in heaven or in earth or in other place, but beauty absolute, separate, simple, and everlasting, which without diminution and without increase or any change is imparted to the ever-growing and perishing beauties of other things. And see, the way that Diotima is defining beauty here, it's synonymous with my understanding of God. It's eternal, immortal, imperishable. It cannot change. It does not fluctuate. It is complete, whole, not lacking anything. And that's what we're drawn to, like moss to a flame. There's something about that because it's so different from us. We crave it because we don't have it. And the true order of going or being led by another to the things of love is to begin from the beauties of earth and mount upwards for the sake of that other beauty, using these as steps only. So we are to look for beautiful things in the world, beautiful music, art, sculpture, thoughts, people, animals, landscapes. But don't get distracted thinking that that is the end. Those are just physical manifestations, broken, flawed manifestations of something that is much higher and eternal. And here you see, once again, a reference to those platonic forms. Anything in the physical material is going to be tainted, but in the ideal forms, that's where it's eternal and perfect. This, my dear Socrates, said the stranger of Mantinea, is that life above all others which man should live in the contemplation of beauty absolute, a beauty which if you once beheld, you would see not to be after the measure of gold and garments or fair boys and youths, 
whose presence now entrances you, and you and many a one would be content to live seeing them only and conversing with them without meat or drink. If they, if that were possible, you only want to look at them and to be with them. But what if man had eyes to see true beauty, the divine beauty, I mean pure and dear and unalloyed or unalloyed? Not clogged with the pollutions of mortality and all the colors and vanities of human life thither looking and holding converse with the true beauty simple and divine remember how in that communion only beholding beauty with the eye of the mind he will be enabled to bring forth not images of beauty but realities for he has hold not of an image but of a reality and bringing forth a nourishing true virtue to become the friend of god and be immortal if mortal man may and would that be an ignoble life and such phaedrus and i speak not only to you but to all of you were the words of diatema and i am persuaded of their truth and being persuaded of them i try to persuade others that in the attainment of this end human nature will not easily find a helper better than love and therefore also i say that every man ought to honor him as i myself honor him and walk in his ways and exhort others to do the same and praise the power and spirit of love according to the measure of my ability now and ever. These words which I have spoken you, Phaedrus, may call a comium of love or anything else that you please. And when Socrates was done speaking, the company applauded and Aristophanes was beginning to say something to answer to the allusion which Socrates had made to his own speech when suddenly there was a great knocking at the door of the house as of revelers and the sound of a flute girl was heard. Okay, so that's from um, the, um, dang it, the Phaedro, Phaedro is where that dialogue came from about love. And I just wanted to give you, I know that was a lot to kind of sit through, but I just wanted to give you a sample of what a Socratic dialogue sounded like, where you're doing this exchange, trying to come up with this conception. Um, but so you can even do a crossover, right, into like the God of the Hebrews or the Christian conception of deity. Um, God is love. God isn't craving love or desiring love. He can't have any more love than he already has. But it's, a, it's like this part and outflow of who God is. But he can never be diminished in love, and he can never receive more love. It's part of what trips me out when, when I go to chapels, or especially when I hear praise bands. And you even see this in the Psalms, where you have David or other people saying, Lord, we exalt you. We magnify your name. We praise you. We bring honor and glory to you. But how do you bring honor and glory? How do you lift up someone who is ex exalted above all things? That doesn't even make any sense. Now, I could see you saying, we acknowledge your exaltation. We acknowledge your glory. We quiver at your greatness. But to say, we lift you up, we exalt you, we praise you. I mean, it's like, no, that's not what's happening. Now, maybe from your human perspective, you think, but there's nothing we can give to God that God does not already have. Where on the other hand, we are an incredibly lacking people. There's all sorts of things we lack and need. My lack is, is like a black hole. I mean, it would take the goodness of God to fill my emptiness. And I, I, just, I just think this is a very high view of God. We are not talking about Zeus and Athena and those torts of deities. This conception Socrates and Diatema are rolling out is a very high conception of God. And that's why some people like to call Socrates like a pre-Christ Christian. He is not talking like these other polytheistic people who have these anthropomorphic deities 
but he's talking in a very abstract, categorically, God is the good, the true, and the beautiful. Those are all synonyms of the one. All right, any other comments or questions? I think I'm out of steam today, and I think I want to end on that. And then next class, I want to roll out a couple more. We won't go so heavy or so involved, but I do want to you guys to be aware of Plato's chariot analogy, where it's kind of like the will is, is like the chariot driver, but then you have a horse, which is like reason, and another which is like passion, and the chariot driver is trying to keep control of the vehicle. And it's like his metaphor of like the human and how we have to wrestle with these different parts of us. And it's a quite beautiful um, parable, I guess you could call it, or allegory, allegory of the chariot. And we'll probably start with that next class. And then I think it would be fun to talk a little bit about some of Plato's political philosophy. And then if, if we still have time, we could talk about his aesthetics. I'll allude a little bit to his ethics, but like I said, I cover that really deeply in another class. So I'd like to spend time in parts of Plato I don't normally get to talk about. I, I mean, I absolutely love his political philosophy on paper. Um, in reality, it's basically the Third Reich and it's quite horrifying. In fact, hit the Third Reich used Plato as their playbook to, to build their system. It, it's basically based on Plato's Republic. So we'll be looking at that. And once again, it's a beautiful idea on paper, but when you see historically, when people have tried to apply it, when I first read the Republic, I was like, I was like, oh my God, I'm reading about Nazi Germany because it's all about censorship, control, very top-down pyramided, all the con powers focus here on the top, and then it comes down into like a pyramid society. But the difference is in Plato's Republic, it's the philosophers who are supposed to be on top making all the rules. And then you have like law enforcement, military, security, and then you have the hoi polloi, the craftsmen, the ditch diggers, the farmers, the musicians, the poets military, um, security, police, enforcement, philosophers. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll pick up on that next class.